Last week, we opened up the idea of what is doubt. Uh, Doubt is uh, to waver uh, in two places at once. It's literally to waver on the fence, to sit on the fence and watch others make decisions. Doubt can be good if it, makes a, if it makes you push into the things of God's truth. But as we learned last week, doubt can push you uh, into an area where you actually drift and distrust the things of God. That's, last week we talked about, again, how can you lean into doubt to where it can leverage a growing relationship with God. But this week we're going to talk about what happens when you drift. Uh, what happens um, uh, when you allow your doubts to become what you believe and when you're no longer dependent upon God's truth, but when you begin to look at things with your own truth. So when you're faced with doubt, last week we talked about, uh, you'll either drift uh, away from truth or you will dig. So last week when, uh, when people were faced with doubt, we should leverage them again for Christ. But this week we're going to talk about what happens when they fall in disbelief. Now, a few years ago, uh, we were in South Africa. We were in South Africa more, more recently. But a few years ago, we were with a big group that um, we, on one of our day off, days off, uh, we went to this gigantic ravine. In fact, it was the biggest ravine in South Africa. And this gigantic ravine um, was actually the one that inspired the ravine in The Lion King. If you remember that movie, uh, uh, there's a scene where Simba goes down and he runs and then Mufasa, uh, you know, has to go run after him and then Mufasa dies, right? It was just a a horrific part of that movie. Uh, Well, that's where this scene uh, was inspired by, this this gigantic ravine. And so we got to go see this ravine. It was beautiful. Uh, But one of the things that you could do is you could bungee jump into the ravine. And so you could pay a little bit extra, and you could bungee jump into this ravine. I wanted nothing to do with it, but of course my team's like, we're doing it, we're doing it. And so people began to jump into the ravine. They're having fun. They would scream, Wah! and then come up all smiling. And, and eventually, after about two or three people uh, went ahead and did it, um, what ended up happening is that uh, they, they come up to me, and they said, Andy, it's your turn. It's your turn. I'm like, no, 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 I'm not doing it. I'm not. And they go, do it, do it, do it. Now, I don't know about you. When people say, do it. It's like a magical word. It's a word that's like, okay, I guess I got it. It's like the magic word, right? If you want someone to do something, you just like, do it. And I'm like, okay, right? It's really, really bad, all right? So anyway, I'm like, okay, I guess I'm going to do it because they said do it. But I'm only going to do it, though, if our mission partner, Don Olding, would do it with me, all right? Now, if you've ever met Don, he is a larger in life, but he's afraid of heights. He's like, no, bro, I'm not doing it. It's like, well, I'm not doing it if you do it. So he's like, fine. So we went and paid uh, our, our, our wage to make sure we can jump into the ravine. They put the safety harness on us. And as they put the safety harness on us, they put a rope behind us. So when we jump in, we'll bounce right back up. So the crazy thing about this is once you have the safety harness on, you literally go to the edge of the ravine, looking 1,000 feet down and saying, okay, the only instruction is just walk off, jump. <laughs> I'm like, okay, but you know, what should kick in at this point is your logic. What should kick in is saying, I don't want to jump off this ledge. I don't think I should walk off. And that's a good thing because in in typical situations, if you walk off a ledge like that, you die. So again, your heart should race a little bit. You should sweat a little bit because it's defying your logic. And so the guy that harnessed us up, he's like, okay, who's going? He's like, well, he's going. Don points at me. He goes, no, he's going. He's going. We spent the next five minutes debating who was going to go first. His heart was racing. I was sweating. And I'm like, okay, fine. I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to go ahead and do it. So I get ready to jump off or just, I was going to walk off. I noticed that there were frays in my harness. And I realized, wait a minute. I was like, I go up to the guy who harnessed me on. I was like, what are these frays? I don't think this thing could hold me up. And he begins to like, you know, put put his hands on the phrase and begins to, you know, look at the harness. He's like, oh, oh, we need to get you a new harness. I was like, exactly, I knew it. And so I backed off the the, the ledge and I realized at this moment, I'm not jumping off. Why? Because here's the deal. Jumping off the ledge and into a ravine, it defies logic. You have to realize if I'm going to jump off this thing and I want to survive, something better hold me up. But when I looked at the thing that was supposed to hold me up and I realized that it was faulty, I'm like, I'm out. And the guy goes, yeah, they usually last five years. Uh, You know, we were going to replace it next month. So I was like, okay, wait, these things are supposed to last 60 months and I'm on month 59. Come on, man, right? (laughs) Oh, you know, I had doubts. I asked questions. I had further doubts. And eventually I walked away from the ledge and I didn't 
bungee. You know, as I reflect on this and I tell this story, it reminds me of what so many people are doing with their doubts in Christ. Many Christians are faced with trust uh, issues with God and, and because they're, they're maybe going through hard situations of life or maybe you've been let down or, or maybe uh, they, you, you've, you've, you've just... You've been a kid in the faith, and you've never grown up into being an adult in the faith. You've never matured in the faith, and you're, and you're facing things in your life, and, and you're on that ledge this morning, and you're like, will God hold me up? And you're on the edge this morning, and you don't know what to do. You know, Soren Kierkegaard, he is a philosopher uh, that uh, actually led one of my Bible profs to Christ, not personally, but through his writings. And he's famously attributed to what's called the leap of faith. The leap of faith. Uh, this is the thinking that can turn, this is what he says about the leap of faith. He says, thinking can turn toward itself in order to think about itself and, skip, and skepticism can emerge. But this thinking about itself never accomplishes anything. Let me read this again because he's a philosopher and he doesn't say it simply, okay? He says, thinking can turn towards itself in order to think about itself and skepticism can emerge. But this thinking about itself never accomplishes anything. Basically what he is saying is this, is that when you need to make a decision, all right, you begin to think about the ramifications of that decision. The ramifications, am I going to actually do this thing? The thing is this, what he's saying is, there's never a point where you can't think about what you're thinking about. There's never a point where you can't just stop being a, a fence setter, right? Where you're just like, I'm going to think about what I'm going to think about what I'm going to think about, which means you're doing nothing. And what Soren Kierkegaard says, eventually there's a point where you have to think about it, but then you have to stop thinking about it and making a choice. And he calls that the leap of faith. Uh, what, what he's saying is this, he's saying that, you can try to prove something, but there's always something that could be thought of that can make you skeptical of what you're thinking. He's not saying to stop thinking about that something. He's just saying, eventually, you have to get off the fence. There's a point, according to Kurt Gard, where logic will not prove enough for you to make a choice. You have to have faith that what you're about to do is right, hence the leap of faith. It's not that the leap of faith, if you're making a leap of faith uh, just because you're making it, you're correct. What's important is whatever you're making that leap of faith into, it's the object of your faith that is of utmost importance. Many people make leaps of faith into things they should not have faith in. But I'm, what I'm telling you today is what we see in scripture is that we are to have faith in God. So when I was asked to take the leap of faith into a ravine, I had doubts about jumping that defied the logic. But when the harness wouldn't hold me up, I had doubts about the harness. I walked away. So Kierkegaard is saying, if you're going to take the leap of faith, it has to be with faith that in God, he will hold you up. Do you believe this morning that God will hold you up in your situations? Do you believe that? If, if, if you're wavering in that this morning, if you're unsure about that, you may be looking and you may be standing at the ledge and you may be standing there for a while, or maybe some of you, you've taken a few steps back from the Lord even this morning. Here's the deal. You can't have faith on the fence. You can't have faith if you're not willing to trust God to hold you up. And what we have today is many people are not trusting God at the expense of, uh, you know, of, of having a growing relationship with him. People are not trusting God, but instead they're trusting themselves or they're trusting other things or they're trusting a quasi-Jesus. And as a result, many are drifting away from the faith. Maybe you feel that way this morning too. And what I want you to know is this. If you feel like you're drifting downstream from where you should be going in the Lord, I want you to know this is not a message to point a finger at you and say, how dare you? This is a message of encouragement to say, start swimming again. The Lord is with you. But we should not be surprised when people want nothing to do with God any longer in life. When prolific speakers or pastors or just church congregants who are once faithful followers of Christ who are no longer. In fact, Paul reminds us in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. He said the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. You, you see, this is our main idea this morning. Many will drift. Many will drift while a few will persevere. Many will drift while a few will persevere. 
So today in our time, we're going to look at why people drift. Uh, where does drift end? Where does it result? And how do we handle those then who are drifting and how may you persevere? Many will drift, but few will persevere. Do you feel like you're drifting or persevering in the faith this morning? Ask yourself that. Be honest. So let's talk about why do people drift from the faith? Uh, I was once working with somebody uh, before my days in Kenosha, so this is a long time ago. Uh, they were a pastor. Uh, that we did a few events together. Uh, well, something happened in his life. He had many just unfortunate events that happened in his life. Uh, in fact, he got so discouraged, he stepped away from ministry. Uh, he then, uh, his family began to crumble apart. And in that, he walked away from God. It was, it was, it was just incredible. Because I saw this person being dynamic in the things of, of God, but yet in this moment, he was cursing God. I'm like, how could this be? The circumstances allowing him to not believe in God anymore. And again, this was the first of many people that I have now witnessed that held on to the things of God that are now walking away from the things of God. I've seen churchgoers, I've seen pastors, I've seen theologians in the last decade. And it's popular to, to be drifting away from the faith right now. People, if you, if you put that, that you're drifting away from the faith and you have problems with God on Facebook, you're going to find people that are going to encourage you to drift. You are. And the thing is, is that it is not invoked to to. Be a faithful follower of Christ, it's invoked to be a faithful follower of your own thoughts. And we're told by Paul to Timothy that we are not to be surprised that people will walk away from the faith, that people are turning to a different Jesus or walking away from Jesus altogether. They're twisting God's word or not reading God's word at all. Now, the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith. We're not to be surprised at this. It's heartbreaking, though. In fact, Paul would even mention how heartbreaking this is. He mentions a man by the name of Demas. He's only mentioned a few times in Scripture, uh, but his story is heartbreaking. Paul gives us a template of how to make disciples through his letters. He would reach people with the gospel. He would do life with people, everyday life. He would teach them through Scripture uh, uh, how to be a faithful follower of Christ, and he would deploy them in missions and ministry. And so, again, that is our template as well. We're to reach people for Jesus. We're to disciple them in Jesus. And we're to deploy them to do likewise. And that's why here at Kenosha City Church, it's our core value that we aren't just consumers, spiritual consumers. We are spiritual contributors. So Paul wants us all to go in with ministry. All in with ministry. But I would be lying to you today if there wasn't risk. There's always a risk that the person that you are pouring your life into will, won't follow Christ for a lifelong period. There may be a risk that somebody that you've given your life to and that you've given your resources to, uh, for, for them to become a fully-fledged follower of Jesus Christ won't walk away from Christ. There's no guarantee. And Paul knew this all too well. He knew this all too well. This happened to his disciple named Demas. Demas, he traveled with some of the most famous people in the New Testament. And at the end of the letter of Colossians, uh, we, we see that, that Demas is so well known that, that he's been given a greeting. Uh, the church of Colossae, they, they knew Demas. Demas encouraged them. He was dynamic in ministry. He, he even followed and, and walked along with Dr. Luke. Luke is the one who wrote the, the gospel of Luke. He wrote the book of Acts. In fact, Paul calls Demas a fellow laborer in Philemon 23 Verse 24, we see Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, sends you greetings. What Paul's doing here is he's ending his letter, and he usually ends his letter with greetings of people he knows really well and are doing dynamic work. So we see Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, sends you greetings, and so do Mark, uh, uh, Arstrish, <laughs> Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. Now, notice Demas' name is still listed here as a fellow worker. What's interesting about this, in the Greek, fellow workers is just somebody who shows up to, you know, just, okay, I'm here. What do you want me to do? Uh, he had a position in which he was entrusted with the gospel, making disciples. But yet, when we get to Paul's final letter before his execution, we see in 2 Timothy 4.10 something absolutely heartbreaking. 2 Timothy 4.10, make every effort to come to me soon because Demas has deserted me since he loved this present world and has gone to Thessalonica. Make every effort to come to me soon because 
Demas has deserted me. you got to imagine, Paul is about to be executed. He's lonely in prison. And his fellow worker, seeing how hard maybe Christianity is to walk, deserts him. Now, what Paul doesn't list here, he doesn't list here why he deserted him or the, all the grievances that he has. Paul doesn't go into gossip. No, rather, uh, he's informing Demas is no longer walking with us. It's a fact. Demas left Paul. But he didn't just depart Paul. He departed his ministry. For what we see here is he fell in love with the world. He walked away from God to live in the comfort of the world's system. For you, to, when the Bible says that you fall in love with the world, doesn't mean that you fell in love with a mountain range or a particular ocean or favorite vacation spot. No, what, what it means is this. The world is the world's philosophies apart from God. The world's system apart from God. Demas fell in love with the philosophy of the day, the values and moralities of the culture. He loved fitting in, and in that, he drifted into disbelief. It's heartbreaking for Paul, and it's a cautionary tale for all of us, number one, for our life, but also for you to re remember when you do ministry, there's risk. You are not Jesus. You are not the predictor of the future. It means when you do ministry, you plant those seeds. But there's never guarantee. Because many will drift while a few will persevere. Where are you at this morning? Are you drifting or are you persevering? First Timothy 4, 1 again. Now the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. And we need to understand, this really hits close to home, it seems like, today in our everyday experience, doesn't it? Today that we see in our own culture, people are drifting at an unprecedented rate. Christianity is growing around the, around the world at unprecedented levels. But in our particular culture, we are seeing an unprecedented drift happening before our very eyes. I mentioned last week there was an article, in fact, a, a Pew Research came out with a projection. By 2070, Christianity will be the minority in America. But I went under the hood a little bit, looked at their, their data. Uh, that's at the constant rate. They said that if things continue to accelerate, which they are with younger generations, they said that Christianity could become the minority religion by 2045 uh, in the United States. 2045. 2070 is a kind of out there. 2045, that's closer. So let me give you some definition to this. Those that are born-again followers of Christ, I'm not talking about people religious Christians, but born-again followers of Christ have always been the minority. All right, let's, let's, when, when, you, when you read that Christianity by a religion is going to become a, a minority, that means anybody who would ever consider themselves a Christian. Oh, I went to church at Easter. Or, uh, I grew up Catholic. I grew up Lutheran. I grew up Baptist. I grew up all these different things, but I don't do anything. Okay, well, um, that, that's, that's fine, but are you actively following Christ now? Do you have, do you, have you placed your personal faith and trust in Christ, of which most people would give a deer in the headlights? Like, huh? Right? And so... Those who are born-again followers of Jesus, no matter what church or denomination they're in, if they're, if they're a born-again follower of Jesus, they've always been a minority. Jesus said this. He said, wide is the road that leads to destruction, and many are on it. And narrow is the road that leads to life, and few will find it. So what road are you on? Because many will assume you're on the right road. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm good enough, and usually you compare yourself to somebody, the lowest common denominator of society. I'm not better than that person. And you assume that you're on the narrow road that leads to life. But assumption does not give you guarantee. Uh, the assumption does not bring you salvation. You need the salvation of Jesus to give you the assurance, not your assumption. So what road are you on? Many assume because their grandparents were Christians or their parents are Christians or they go to church for Christmas and these individuals are what I call Christian in name only. And that is the majority of what constitutes what people call themselves Christians in our society today. And that's shrinking fast. And instead, people are now saying, well, I know that, you know, my parents are Christians, but I'm, what are you? I don't know, nothing. You're nothing? And in fact, the census called the nothings nuns, Right? <laughs> nuns. I was given a presentation on this on the rise of the majority of the nuns. And one person looked at me like, we're all becoming nuns? I was like, no, 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 no not nuns. All right, nothings, all right? We, we don't believe in anything religiously. We don't believe anything about God. Could God be real? I guess, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. It's not really relevant. 
So this is different than atheism, which atheism explicitly says God doesn't exist. Uh, a nothing would be like, well, maybe he doesn't exist, or maybe he does. Right? It's just kind of like that. That is the majority of, of what is rising up uh, in our culture. And so by 2045, the nothings could become the majority. That means the majority of the people wouldn't even claim anything. And so somebody like, okay, that's 2045. We have some time. We have some time to turn this around. Oh, yeah? How's Kenosha doing? Right? You, you, you want to get real? How's Kenosha doing, right? Well, let's take a look at the latest census data. Uh, some of you are like numbers people, like, oh, yes. We're in our Revelation series, all you people that lit up. When I put charts on here, you're going to love this. All right? So anyway, there are 15,183 people that say they attend an evangelical church. 15,183. That means they preach the gospel and say it's good to share the gospel. That's what it means to be evangelical. All right, we, we need to say that because evangelical has become a political term, unfortunately. Uh, it is not a political block. Evangelical means that you believe in the evangelion. That's where we get evangelical. It means the gospel. If you're evangelical, you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you believe that it should be shared. All right, that's the definition of it. All right, let nobody else hijack that definition, okay? And so, 15,183 in Kenosha County would say they are a Bible-believing Christian. That's only 9% of our county. It's not a lot. In contrast, you ready for this? 104,426 people say they identify as nothing. We have 104,000 nuns, not nuns, but nothings. They say they don't believe in anything. That is 62% of Kenosha County right now that say they don't believe in anything. They don't go into church doors. Uh, they, 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 don't, they don't engage in anything spiritually uh, when it comes to, to the Bible, which makes Kenosha County, listen to this. You can see this from the census. It makes Kenosha County one of the most underreached areas of the United States. It's true. People are like, wait, I, it doesn't really feel that way. That's right. Because 28% is, uh, people are still connected to the, histor the historical religious background. People are like, I guess I'm Catholic. I'm guessing this. I'm guessing I'm Baptist. I'm guessing this. You know, people that would say uh, they, they're still kind of religious, but that is going away. And so because we have that religious veneer here still in this town, 29%, it masks the, the reality that 62% or 64% rather of our county does not know Jesus and considers themselves nothing. 62%, sorry. I said 64. That's going to matter here for a second, okay? 62%. It's being masked because we still have 28% that say they're religious. So I'm like, there's no way that Kenosha County is one of the most underreached areas. In the, and what about San Francisco? Everybody picks on San Francisco, don't they? What about San Francisco? Well, I'm glad that you asked. So let's take a look at San Francisco. San Francisco has a much smaller evangelical population at 3.8%, all right? But 64% of San Francisco are nothings. 64% San Francisco, 62% Kenosha. We are in one of the most underreached areas of the country. That should be a wake up call, isn't it? It should be a wake up call that Kenosha is unreached. That should break our hearts. Uh, there, this is no time for the church to, to build a club. Uh, this is no time for the church to, to hunker down and say, okay, Jesus, I'm, I, I'm, I'm hunkering down. You remember when they, we used to do this back in school when they're like, all right, a tornado drill, and they'd have you go underneath the desk, and I always wondered, how is this going to save me? Anyway, uh, and put the textbook over your head, right? But sometimes we do that in the church. We're like, okay, I'm hunkering down, Jesus, please, please, please come back, right? That's no time to do that, right? It is no time to look at the 15,183 and say, oh, yeah, we got the coolest church. I want to reach the reached. We don't need to reach the 15,000. We need to reach the 104,426 that have given up on church that say they're nothing. Amen? And it's increasing. This isn't even the latest census data. It's increasing because the millennials and Gen Z and Gen Alpha are leaving the faith at even more incredible rates. We're an unreached area. And because the youth are departing the faith at a rapid rate, we need to reach the city now. Now. 
Now, some will depart from the faith, some, and it seems like in this society, a lot. Because what Paul says here, they're paying attention to deceitful spirits. Now, the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. Now, what he's not talking about are theological differences on minor areas that uh, don't have huge ramification, right? Uh, people will, you know, fight over, okay, uh, his mode of worship, or they may fight over, uh, you know, the, what should the pastor dress in a robe or a t-shirt or suit and tie? You can fight about that all you want, all right? Sometimes people treat that as important as the resurrection of Jesus. It's not, all right? But what's important is the resurrection of Jesus, the virgin birth, the scripture, right? And yet we see here that people will depart from the foundations of the faith. Uh, it is not because of some nice podcaster with a great background when you watch it on YouTube. No, we see here, behind it all, it's demonic. What we see here is the confusion, the confusion that many people are experiencing in their life and taking steps back from God, it is demonic. Make no mistake, people today drift away from the faith, they often want to know why. Well, Paul says why, but does that mean that there are other reasons of course there is and we're going to go into that but i want to say this before we go into the reasons it's too easy to shift your blame to somebody else we have to understand that when we stand before god in eternity we are personally responsible for placing our faith and trust in jesus and we're personally responsible to be obedient so what are some reasons why people are drifting today? I think this is important. The first one is this, questioning inerrancy. You're like, in it, what? <laughs> what? What word is that? Well, you know, we're going to learn some new vocab today, all right? So you better be taking notes on the app, all right, in the Kenosha City Church app, all right? Questioning inerrancy. Inerrancy is this, the Bible's without error. Uh, if you think the Bible's full of errors, you are heading to spiritual turbulent times, Inerrancy means, again, the Bible is without errors. Let me give you a, a theological definition here. Scripture in the original manuscripts does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. Isaiah 40, verse 8, gives us a promise of upholding God's word. We see the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God remains forever. Uh, God is going to uphold his word. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And when you believe in inerrancy, when you believe that God is actually going to give us something true without error, uh, it leads us to understand that he indeed inspired it. The inspiration is the words of Scripture are spoken by God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so it's not just that it's without error. It's without error because God spoke it. He spoke it through over 40 different authors perfectly over a span of 1,500 years. And then, because it's spoken by God, it's been inspired by God, it's infallible. That is the idea that Scripture is not able to lead us astray in the matters of faith and practice. So it's inerrant, it's inspired, it's infallible. But when we begin to question the inerrancy of Scripture, all of these things begin to fall away. And this is often when I hear people that are, are opposed to, to God or are drifting from orthodoxy. It, the first thing I often hear about whatever's causing them to dislike certain areas of scripture is that they believe the Bible has errors. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. Do we believe the Bible has errors? Do we believe that? Now, have you ever struggled with that? Have you ever heard that before? Does the Bible actually have errors? Is this book a perfect book? So let's draw a line in the sand because this can help us when it comes, it's gonna help us when it comes to moral, morality, sexuality, uh, hot topic issues such as abortion or, 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 or uh, how we treat each other, everything. Uh, everything that we do, if we believe that God's word is without error, it's gonna provide the worldview of which you, the lens of which you view everything. My secular professors, they would laugh at me when I would talk about the Bible. Uh, how could you believe that? They'd say that, and that's usually what they do. They'd make fun of you. Instead of going through the facts of it, they'd say, how could you believe that? How could, hey, how could someone in college actually believe in a book of fairy tales like that? And I remember this was the time I was doing a lot of apologetics. I was, I was digging deep. I remember last week I talked about some doubts, and so I dug deep, and I'm like, actually, I can answer that. Yeah? Okay, what is it? I was like, 
There's over 10,000 manuscripts to back up what we have in the Bible today. I mean, one of the biggest things I hear is people say, how could you really believe that the Bible that you have today is the Bible they had back then? And the reality is, we have tens of thousands of manuscripts that when you translate them from the Hebrew, Aramaic, or the Greek, you can see that what is in the manuscripts is what we have today in the Bible. Oh, and they're like, okay. And I, I went on, it's like, hey, you know that, that, that book uh, that we were supposed to read uh, in literature class here at college? Like, yeah, uh, Iliad by Homer? And like, yeah, that only has a thousand manuscripts. That's actually quite impressive for an ancient work. A thousand manuscripts. Yet the Bible has 10,000 manuscripts. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you know, in the history class uh, that we have to take, the World Civ class we have to take about, uh, you know, about Caesars, like, uh, yeah, yeah, that's based on two manuscripts of which I have to take a test, and if I answer something wrong, I, I, I get a check mark, right? Well, if it's not, you know, two manuscripts? So if, if 10,000 manuscripts is not enough, uh, then how can we be tested on something that's only based on two manuscripts? And they're like, uh, okay, sit down, <laughs> you know? The Bible is indeed, and I didn't mean this to be argumentative, but they challenged me in the sense that I believe it's important for us to answer that we don't have to turn off our brains to believe that the Bible is accurate. That is, is the most attested to, is the most backed up doc, ancient document that we have. And why should this surprise us? God prophesied through Isaiah that the word of God will remain forever. The Bible's the most trustworthy document we have on the planet and when people say it's full of errors, it's not just that the manuscripts that we have today back up what we have today, but what about the content? And oftentimes people will point fingers at, well, you know, it just, this, this part of the Bible says this date, and this part of the Bible says this date about the same account, and they're, they're a little off. Like, no, it's rounding, right? <laughs> it's rounding. Uh, so the Bible authors will often round numbers, and, and people will point at that. That's not an error. It's just rounding numbers. They do free quotations, which means they will quote freely instead of um, the MLA of, of exact quotes that we put on our standards today. That wasn't their standards back then. They do a free quotation, but yet the content of that quotation remains to be correct. And often people will point to the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are, are four different authors that talk about the same event. And sometimes they talk about different things or they, or they give a different take on, on the same uh, subject. And people are like, aha, I told you, they can't even agree on it. No, 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 that's not true. Imagine if I was a world-class runner. I'm not, all right? But let's just say I'm a world-class runner and I beat the world record and there were four witnesses, Okay. Each one of those witnesses is going to tell a different part of it. Some may say my reaction when I came to the finish line. One might talk about my shoes. One might talk about how much I was sweating. Uh, one might talk about uh, just something completely different. Maybe the, the buildup to the race or, or how I felt after the race or the crowd reactions. And, and someone may say, well, aha, they're all saying something different. And it's not that them saying something different makes it false. It actually together gives you a complete picture of what actually happened. That's the Gospels. And yet people will point their finger and say, well, yeah, it's an error. No, it's, it's, it's not. And so the, the idea here is this. The idea is that the Bible it does have some areas that are hard, are hard to explain. And sometimes people avoid those hard texts like, oh, maybe this is the error text they're talking about. But it's not. Whenever you experience something hard or you don't understand in Scripture, you just don't throw your hands up and say, okay, errors. No, you, you dig in and say, okay, what is the meaning behind this? And this is the beautiful thing, is that today, theologians, uh, the, the reputable theologians claim there is no unsolved text or contradiction or apparent error. Did you get that? There, there's explanations for the things that people just throw into Google and create headlines so it confuses you. All right? Did you get that? Oftentimes people will throw out things that without study, they're like, ooh, that, that sounds bad. But with further study, you realize, no, it's just I didn't understand. Does that make sense? So the Bible is without error. And again, if, if you have any questions on that, please email me, andy at kenosha.church. I would love to talk to you about that if you, have, if you have questions like, I just don't understand this. But many people begin to start drifting when they're not reading Scripture, when they're not trusting Scripture, when they're not obeying Scripture. And again, if you say the Bible is full of errors, that has major ramifications. It, it, number one, it makes God out to be a liar. He said he's going to uphold his truth. If he didn't uphold his truth, uh, God's a liar. And if you believe that God's a liar, the dominoes begin to drop. If you can't trust him in the small areas, how could you trust him in the large areas, such as the virgin birth, miracles, marriage, sexuality, resurrection, second coming, you name it. 
And if you admit the Bible has errors, you make something out to be a bigger authority than God's word itself. And typically, it's your own mind. Another book, a podcast. So if you're struggling with scripture this morning, this isn't to point a finger at you and saying, how dare you? This just may be actually your breakthrough moment of actually beginning to understand why you can trust God's word. Many will drift and a few will persevere. And that begins and people begin to doubt the inerrancy of scripture. Secondly, influenced by their environment. The second reason why people will begin to drift is they are influenced by their environment. I, I, I was debating of whether to talk about this first before inerrancy, but I believe that wherever you go with God's word, there you will go with your environment. Does that make sense? Our theology will always inform our practice, okay? And so if you have a very weak theology of scripture, that will inform your practice in the rest of your life. Does that make sense? So the second reason why people drift is they are influenced by their environment. 1 Corinthians 15, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. I heard this said another way. You show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Uh, you are who you hang out with. You become what you listen to. Uh, you consume, you, what you consume is what you become. Your environment, specifically the people you hang with, they will influence you. Uh, now, we are told in Scripture to befriend those who think differently than us. We're told to befriend those that are not followers of Christ. But we have to have the intentionality that we are disciples of Jesus first, not pleasers of people. When we flip that, even I've seen people even in ministry flip this where they become pleasers of people at the expense of being disciples of Jesus. They end up waffling and, 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 and breaking convictions in scripture in order to please that person. So we are uh, supposed to reach out to those who think differently than you, but it needs to be intentional understanding you are a disciple of Jesus first. So do you believe that your environment influences you this is back in school they'd call this the the bandwagon effect you know i remember going through dare class and like if you hang out with kids doing drugs you'll do them too right i mean it's 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 that idea and i remember finally people started challenging it. like i don't believe in the bandwagon effect i i don't believe that that people can influence me because i'm strong enough remember a a a girl uh, that was a, a gigantic spiritual leader in a youth group. She stood up one time and was like, I have all these friends, I go to all these parties, and I don't believe in the bandwagon effect. I don't believe in peer pressure. I don't believe they're affecting me. And within one year, that person that declared they didn't believe in peer pressure was head deep into drugs and alcohol. I was talking with someone who was listening to a podcast on someone who is a former Christian. They had deconstructed from their faith, and they listened, and they listened, and they listened to them and I finally asked the question, are you sure listening to this podcast uh, this frequently, are you sure this is helpful? Uh, let me just ask you this question. Are you listening to this podcast more and thinking about this thing more than you are even diving into the word of God? And they gave me the big deer in the headlights look. They realized what they were consuming and how it was influencing them. You indeed are influenced by your environment. Make no mistake. You may say, I can handle it. But know this, to borrow a picture I once heard, you, you, you could think you're, you're tough as steel, made of Teflon, right? But a slow drip will eventually rust through even the strongest metal. Without the intentionality of mission, you show me who you spend your time with or what you're consuming, that's who you'll be influenced by and what you could even become. So your environment is, will influence drift. Other reasons you may drift is confused by circumstances. We may face hard things in life. These hard things of life knock us on the side of the head. We don't know what to do. Uh, it's in these hard things of life uh, that we uh, often, our, our natural inclination is to turn to ourselves. And if we turn to ourselves in hard situations, we run from God. It's, it's in the hard situations that we want to run from God. We get angry with God. We actually need God the most. And yet, when life gets hard, we have the natural tendency to run and drift from him. Another reason why we may drift is we are turned off by hypocrisy. Uh, listen, we'll deal with hypocrisy in the weeks to come, but know this, that people are going to let you down. Okay, We are all natural hypocrites. I'm not saying that to give us a, hey, we can all be hypocrites. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this. I've often heard people say, I'm not going to go to church because it's full of hypocrites. I'm like, where aren't you full of hypocrites? You can go to Woodman's. It's full of hypocrites, right? Go to the gas station, right? Uh, you can go to Chili's. Or, you name it. Full of hypocrites, right? Because we're human. To be human is 
We're going to let each other down, and we're going to become hypocrites, all right? So when someone's like you know, making that whole statement, ah, oh, just full of hypocrites, they become the king or queen of judging the hypocrites. But what they realize is, what they don't realize actually, is that they're a hypocrite themselves by even just making a judgment on hypocrites. So let's stop doing that, right? But there's some truth here. The truth is people indeed can be turned off by actions that are contrary to what we say we believe. And so we need to know if we're to have a powerful witness, if we're to reach the 62% in this county uh, that need Jesus, we need to understand that our witness is on fire uh, when we become fully dependent followers of Jesus Christ. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, when we're filled with the conviction that we need to reach people for Jesus Christ and that our life backs that up, let me tell you this right now, it is fire. People are attracted to that. Now, the reason why people drift is embracing cultural morals. Uh, think of this, uh, you know, when people abandon the, the Bible, uh, they usually embrace something else. And it's usually the morals of and the debates of this day. If you don't have a biblical worldview and a love for God, uh, you won't have the strength uh, to withstand the currents of the day. Our natural inclination is not to become more godly. It is to fit in with culture. Understand that. Which means if you are going to be a fully devoted follower of Christ, often you have to swim upstream and be counterculture. You understand that. The answer to our woes is it what's in culture, okay? The answer to our woes is Jesus Christ and Jesus alone, amen? But that requires us not to look to ourselves for the solutions, but to Almighty God who is the solution. You'll drift when you give your authority toward yourself instead of God's word, you'll drift. And when you drift... The next question is this, where does it end? Where does drift go? It goes to what I call deconstruction. Now, someone may ask, well, wait a minute. When you're drifting, aren't you asking questions? Listen, no, no, no. Questions could actually allow drift or questions can allow you to dig and grow in your faith. Okay, so if you're drifting, yeah, you may have more questions, but the questions actually are happening under the umbrella of what I call deconstruction. Deconstruction is the dismantling of a person's understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ and the refusal to recognize spiritual authority. I often hear this uh, from people that begin to embrace drift. Uh, they begin to say, you know, I'm just, I I'm just understanding the Bible, understanding God in a more nuanced, in a more new way. And they may even drop the D word, I am deconstructing, they may say. What does that even mean? For many, it means that they're undoing what they've learned about uh, in biblical orthodoxy in their upbringing. Uh, for many, it results in no longer believing in the virgin birth, the truthfulness of the Bible, the resurrection. It changes the way they view sex or marriage. Uh, and they believe that they're tearing it all down so that they can build it back up. Uh, deconstruction isn't new, uh, but it's a product and it's become popular because we've embraced a postmodern culture. It was championed by another philosopher, a French philosopher named Derda, um, and his big thing was this, is that we bring meaning to words and culture rather than us finding truth. So the truth is, is what whatever we bring meaning to is what Dirta said. That's very postmodern, very different from what the Bible says. Therefore, when he, Dirta would say is when you read a work, when you read a text like the Bible or when you look at history, you must deconstruct that to see what influenced that person to view that history through that lens. You must deconstruct to see what biases are, or you must deconstruct to see what that person was thinking. And whenever you find a fault in that person, in that hero, uh, in, that, in, that, uh, in that champion, or whatever it is in history, whenever you find something that's wrong with that person, especially through the lens of what culture today values, you get rid of them. You rewrite history. And it's caused historical madness. We are literally rewriting our history through the lens of what we want to see history by to fit our understanding, to fit our narrative. And this is happening today in theology. This is happening today where people are taking things that have been orthodoxy, the things that have been understanding since the days of the disciples and saying, oh, I know this is what they believed, but I have found the meaning. It sounds really pompous, doesn't it? Hey, guess what? I know we've been wrong for the last 2,000 years, but I found the meaning. Or we group in a group. We found a new meaning in Scripture. It sounds pompous, but listen, if you have a postmodern mindset, you're the one bringing the truth. So you don't think you're being pompous because you think you've been given the keys to define what is true. And what happens then is people begin to drift and then they begin to deconstruct. And instead of 
growing in your faith. You're taking a wrecking ball to everything that you believed. And then without a blueprint, you're told to rebuild. Often people don't rebuild. They just live in the rubble. And then in turn, they embrace anything and everything that makes them happy. Live for the moment. And and you see this. You see this idea of deconstructing isn't just in Scripture. Uh, You see it today in science, which science is not a bad thing. Whoever said that science and Christianity are opposed, I think it's... I think the atheists said that, right? Uh, Some of the greatest scientists in the early days, they believed in Jesus. And so we see a deconstructing of of science. We we see a deconstructing of of math. We see a deconstructing of of history. We see a deconstructing of everything that we've known, sexuality, gender, you name it. And it's why we hear things today that would be absurd even five years ago, they're being embraced. I don't mean this to pick on anybody, but, but I'm just going to tell you that, that it's the reason why today you hear of, it's not everywhere, but you hear of in some schools, they're putting kitty litter boxes in the bathrooms for the people that identify as a cat. Why? Because they've deconstructed what it means to be human. They've deconstructed what it means to be a cat. They've deconstructed what it means to be reality and fantasy. And my five-year-old, he came up to me. He said, Daddy? I said, Yes. I like Lightning McQueen. That's the car from Cars, okay? I was like, yeah? What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a car. Right? It would be absolutely foolish for me to begin to arrange his life to be a car. Right? But if you follow deconstruction to its logical end, well, if you want to be a car, you can, you, can, you can identify as a car. And this is happening with theology. People want to take a wrecking ball to God to make him more like us. Truth is not about what we make of it, but it's discovering what actually is truth. And God has given us his truth for us to study, for the wrecking ball to come for our hearts, not towards our God. Now, some Christians have used, let me just make a note here, they're beginning to use the term deconstruction in a nuanced positive way there's i I've, i i heard one pastor a reputable pastor a national pastor he's like oh we all need to deconstruct in our growth so that we can grow in christ what he's meaning is is that when we read scripture and we had a false understanding of a particular verse we need to deconstruct that so we can construct the right understanding um and i that is not how deconstruction has been used since the, the philosopher darda uh, championed it Okay, that is a new understanding of deconstruction. It's, it, it is not a, 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 a faithful uh, definition of that. And so I, I don't think it's helpful to use deconstruction ever in a positive light. Deconstructing means that you're walking away from orthodox Christianity. What, what, what people are trying to use deconstruction is actually a word that we already have in theology. It's called sanctification. We are to grow and be more like Christ. As we grow and be more like Christ, our life adjusts. Our understanding of scripture that may have been faulty, we understand we're coming into truth, okay? Sanctification pushes you to be more like Christ. It renews you. It renews your mind. It reproves you. It's not a wrecking ball. it's, It's making you more like Jesus. And so sanctification is a better word than deconstruction. So deconstruction is the process of where people bit by bit, piece by piece, Remove orthodoxy from their life. And they either construct a Jesus that is not in the Bible or they sit in the rubble. Now, I do know some people have deconstructed and yet God got them in that moment and they walked back into the faith. That is beautiful. But I know more people that have deconstructed that are still sitting in the rubble and their faith is shipwrecked. And what deconstruction typically leads to is this final place. It's called apostasy. Apostasy is decisively turning away from the faith. An apostate uh, is a person who claimed to be a Christian, but has irreversibly abandoned and renounced Orthodox Christianity. Philippians chapter 3, Paul talks about this. He says, join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. For I've often told you, and I say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross, Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is their shame, and they are focused on earthly things, yet our citizenship is in heaven. People will say, okay, are these people that, you know, are now living in in just an apostate condition, they were deconstructing, and now they're living in a condition where they renounce Christ, like, were they saved? Did they lose their salvation? I don't get it, here's the deal. We can debate all day if they were saved or not saved or where they're at. 
But where they're at now is in a very bad place where we need to start preaching the gospel to them again. Many people today, even, even in an apostate condition, they will still claim Jesus. Oh yeah, I gave my life to Christ years and years ago, but their life is, is, is renounced Christ. and Their path is a tornado, it's confusion, it's revenge, it's increased doubt. And we're told the Bible, preach the gospel again to those that have renounced Christ. So deconstruction, if it's not stopped, leads to apostasy. It leads us to another question then. How do you handle those in the process of deconstruction? This isn't to point a finger. If they're in doubting, even if they're in a mode of deconstruction, we are told, and especially in Jude uh, verse 22, that we are to lean in. We're to meet with them. We're to pray with them. We're not to shun them. We're to encourage them. But to those who become evangelists of deconstruction, who use their once podcasts of leading people to Jesus, now they're leading people away from Jesus, scripture is very clear. In church, we need to hear this. Because a lot of us are dancing with people that we're told not to dance with. Romans chapter 16, verse 17, it says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching that you've learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. We are to avoid people that become champions of deconstruction. That become champions of, of not having faith in Christ. That are champions that are championing you away from the word of God. We aren't to dance with them like, oh, I'm just going to keep on listening to podcasts. They're kind of witty. It's like, no, we are to... We are to Move away from that and fill our minds with the truth of God's word. So as we close today, and we're going to pray here in just a second, I want to ask this question. It's going to tee us up for next week. Are you drifting or are you persevering? Many will drift, but a few will persevere. So how are you persevering in the faith? I want to give you three areas this morning. Number one is you need to continue in his word. Often people begin to drift and deconstruct and they don't even know it yet. They will say what they believe, but their actions, their hearts, their affections, the way that they're treating people, whatever, uh, is already way ahead of the game and their definitions and what they claim will catch up. Does that make sense? And it all begins because they are not being rooted in the word of God. John chapter 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews he had, who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We are living in a culture today where doubt and stepping away from historical truth is seen as freedom, but it's actually spiritual prison time. Uh, the truth, God's truth, will set you free, be in his word. Secondly, continue by his spirit. You cannot read God's word and apply it in your life by your own strength. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't skip that step. Romans 8, 13, because if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And finally, you persevere by continually to grow in your actions. It's not just, okay, I made that decision, now I'm gonna stop and I'm just gonna lean in and be the same, right? No, it's allow God to constantly take that wrecking ball to your heart. So let's ask God to do that. Let's ask God to take that wrecking ball to our heart. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to fill us this morning. Let's ask God to help us in our doubts, to help us in the drift. If you begin to deconstruct, let him reconstruct in your life uh, his spirit, his, his word. Let him sanctify you did it this morning. Father, we love you and we thank you. Father, give us the courage for you to take a wrecking ball to our heart. We don't take a wrecking ball to you or your word. We invite you to take a wrecking ball to our heart. So wreck us where we need to be wrecked. Father, uh, we pray that we would, be, we would be people that would be filled with your Holy Spirit. Not that we know about your Spirit. Not that we're like, yeah, I got the Spirit. No, God, help us be renewed and filled afresh with your Holy Spirit this morning, God. Give us the strength. A God, to, to, to be obedient in your word. Give us, a, give us the spirit that we can remember your word. Give us, a, give us the spirit that we can apply your word and be sensitive to what you're doing right now. God, help us. Help those who are drifting this morning. Help them to know there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. As we continue to pray, I just want to talk to two people this morning. First, number one, I want to talk to anybody who doesn't know Christ as Savior. 
If today you're uncertain you're going to heaven, you can be certain of that this morning. Just pray to him right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I, I need you in my life. I, I need you to forgive me of my sins. You see, God created you to have a relationship with him. You're on purpose. You're not an accident. But because you've sinned, because you've done your own thing, you're separated from him. But God being so loving and merciful, he's not a God that's distant and angry and ready to hit you with a lightning bolt. He's a God that's wooing you and drawing you this morning. He came 2,000 years ago to die on the cross, to stand in your place, to take every one of your sins, past, present, and future, to forgive them all at once. How amazing is that? Those sins that bog you down, those, those, those regrets that bog you down. He went to the cross to forgive you, and he died. Because he's a perfect sacrifice, though, death couldn't keep him. He rose from the dead three days later, which is great, because here's the deal. It proves that what he said is true, and it proves that when you place your faith and trust in him, he indeed forgives. So the Bible says that all those who cry out in the name of the Lord will be saved. Will you just cry out in the name of the Lord this morning? Say, Lord Jesus, save me. I need my sins forgiven. I want to place my faith and trust in you alone. If that's you, every head's bowed and eyes closed. You're, like, you're asking Jesus to save you this morning. You're asking Jesus to forgive you of your sins. You're asking Jesus. Uh, you're telling Jesus that you're going to place your full faith and trust in him this morning. If that's you, no one looking around, we just slip up your hand. Just like, yeah, that's me. I'm giving my life to Christ this morning. I'm asking, thank you. I'm asking him to forgive me of my sins. I'm, ask, I'm placing my faith and trust in him alone. Anybody else? Just raise that hand up high and say, that's me me thank you let's continue for everybody in this room where do you need the wrecking ball to hit your heart where do you need the fullness of the holy spirit will you let god do that will you let him do that father i pray for those those doubts and those drifts god reverse the course fill us with your spirit so that we may swim upstream god allow the wrecking ball to hit the areas that our heart where it's become hard we love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As a church, it is our honor to be a small part in all that God is doing in and through your life. And we would love to continue with you on that journey. To find out more about what your next steps can be at Kenosha City Church, all you have to do is go to kenosha.church slash next steps. Thanks again for joining us today.